Hello, this is Professor Dan Kernler of Elgin Community College. This is another video in my statistics series. In this video, we talk about the distribution of the sample mean. Okay, let's get to it. All right, you know the drill by now. We're going to introduce this idea by way of an example. I have up here um, the mother's socioeconomic status from our Children of Immigrants database. I'll put that link uh, in the description. Uh, socioeconomic status is like income and wealth. And so there's this uh, rating in that database. I believe it's from 0 to 100. You can see the distribution, very skewed right, uh, very skewed right distribution. Um, what if we wanted to, instead of looking at the distribution of the mothers, what if instead we kind of had this visual to represent all of the mothers and we look at samples, say a sample of size 10, and we look at the sample mean distribution. And our y-axis then, instead of the proportion of mothers, would be the proportion of sample means. Okay, well, we would take a sample, say this sample of size 10, compute its mean, we get 38, put that up on our histogram. Do another sample, say this sample, its mean is 26, put that up on the histogram, and then keep doing these. And when we do all samples of size 10, this is actually a, isn't all samples of size 10 because there's way too many of them and that would take too long to compute. But this is a really good um, number of them. And you can see interesting, very different distribution for the sample means. Now there's a couple of good points you should recognize here. First of all, they're much more condensed, but that makes sense because the means have 10 in the sample. And so one or two outliers are going to be pulled down closer to the actual mean because there's all those 10 individuals in that sample. And the second is they're centered at actually the same point where the mean is for the population. We can see that here if we put the mother's socioeconomic status back up here. We look at the mean, 34.2 for all of the sample means. So the mean of the sample means and the mean of the population, 34.2, which again should make sense. On average, your sample mean should be what the population mean is. So that's a pretty reasonable result. The standard deviations, as we said, it's much smaller, 5.3 for the sample means, uh, and then 16.9 overall. By the way, notationally here, S is the sample standard deviation, and you'll notice a subscript for um, the sample means, S sub X bar. So the standard deviation of the sample means. I didn't do that for the X bar because it felt weird to write X bar sub X bar, but it's really the sample mean of the sample means. All right, let's do some other ones here. Here's the distribution of the mother's socioeconomic status. Here's a distribution of the sample means if we did only sample size five. You can see more spread out, definitely still skewed right a little bit. Here's that sample of size 10. What if we do 20 and then 30? You see we're getting more and more condensed the larger our sample size is because the more individuals in our sample, the more likely we're gonna end up right close to that actual mean. In terms of the distribution, we have 34.2 is the mean overall, and then we have a standard deviation of 16.9. If we look at samples of size five, same mean, smaller standard deviation, 10, 20, 30, right? The standard deviation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're getting more condensed the larger our sample size. If we put them all up here, kind of compare the original 34.2, 16.9, then we have the other three or four different sample sizes. And again, you can see the trend here is that the means are all the same. They're all 34.2, but the standard deviation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as the sample size increases. What about the distribution shape? Well, for the mothers, very skewed right. We talked about that. You can clearly see that. For the sample size five, Still skewed right, becoming more bell-shaped. Size 10, then 20, and then 30. This is pretty bell-shaped by the time you get to a sample of size 30, and that is a huge result. As the sample size increases, the distribution becomes more symmetric. It becomes more bell-shaped. All right, let's focus just on the original and then the sample of size 30. We did say the means are the same. That's gonna be true. On average, your sample mean should be the same as the population mean, regardless of sample size. So notationally, we can say mu sub x bar, the mean of all the sample means will be 
the same as the population mean. Now, standard deviation is different. Clearly, there's some relationship here that as n increases, this standard deviation of the sample mean decreases. Now, this isn't obvious at all, but it actually happens to be if you take that original standard deviation and you divide by the square root of the sample size, you get the standard deviation of the sample means. Now that is not an intuitive result whatsoever. It's just something you're going to have to write down. If we generalize that and give you some notation, it would be sigma sub x bar, the standard deviation of all the sample means. That is the population standard deviation sigma over the square root of the sample size. So focusing on just those, again, the mean of all the sample means is the mean of the population. Whereas the standard deviation of all the sample means is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Now there are some conditions. We saw this wasn't true for the small sample size. So we're going to put a little asterisk here. This is technically only true if x is normally distributed. Now ours was not. Ours was skewed right. But if x is normally distributed, it'll be fine. Or if your sample size is large, whatever that means, there's no hard line for that. Typically, a good guide is a sample size of at least 30. The more skewed the distribution, the larger your sample size needs to be to get to make sure that the sample means will be um, symmetrically distributed, that bell-shaped curve. Formally, this is called the central limit theorem, and it tells you the distribution of the sample means. All right, let's finish with an example. Um, I've got a picture here of my son, my youngest son. He was three at this time. Um, the, the mean height of three-year-old boys is about 37.4 inches with a standard deviation of 1.4 inches. His height at this point was about 36 and a half inches. We, I looked up his medical records actually. So the question you might have is, all right, is this child short? Is how, what percentage of three-year-old boys um, are shorter than he is? Well, that's a normal distribution question. Uh, we know 37.4 is in the middle. We have a standard deviation of 1.4. So we can go out 1.4, another 1.4, another 1.4. Uh, and then we can put our 36.5 on there. Should be, let's see, about here. Yep, 36.5. And then we want to find the probability of being to the left of that. We can do this in uh, stat crunch. We just go to um, stat calculators, and then normal, put in our mean, 37.4, our standard deviation, 1.4, we'll go to the left of 36.5 and hit compute. And that tells us that about 26% of kids are shorter than 36 and a half inches. So not super short, definitely on the lower end, but not super short. What if instead of an individual, we had a sample of size 20? And we want to know, would a sample mean of 36 and a half be unusual? Or 36 and a half or less, we should say. Well, we'll need to know the distribution of those sample means. We know it's not going to be the same distribution because we know the standard deviations get smaller as the sample size increases. Well, if we look at the central limit theorem, we know that the mean of all the sample means is the same as the mean of the population. So we're going to have 37.4 there in the middle. But our 36.5 might be here, might be way down at the end. We, we just don't know where it's going to be without knowing the standard deviation. The central limit theorem says if your original variable is normally distributed, which heights are, then your standard deviation of your sample means should be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So this would be 1.4, that was our population standard deviation, over the square root of 20, which is about 3 tenths. And I'm, I'm rounding significantly here just so I can do a quick graph on the normal distribution curve. So using 3 tenths, we have these values here. So now we know our 36.5 is actually way over on the left, way over on the left. We want to find the probability of being to the right of that. We can do this in stack crunch as well. Um, we can still do the same mean, 37.4, but our standard deviation, I'm actually going to just type in, so I'm not rounding here, 1.4 divided by the square root of 20. And then we still want less than or equal to 36.5. Wow, now we get a much smaller probability. Now we knew that because we had the normal curve there. We knew it was way over on the left. But this probability is 0 0.002. So only two out of a thousand samples, 
of size 20 of three-year-old boys would have heights of 36 and a half inches or less. So if we had a random sample of 23-year-old boys and their mean height was 36 and a half inches, there's something weird going on there because that is super unlikely to happen randomly. There's probably something different about that particular sample of three-year-old boys because we got a, such a low probability. Now you compare this to the probability of being less than uh, 36 and a half inches for one boy. That was 26%, probability of 0.26, much higher. The key here is you have to distinguish, am I looking at one individual and a probability question about the height of that single individual or am I looking at a sample and is my question about the sample mean? That's gonna be really important for you, especially like for my students when we have tests, you're gonna to have to distinguish, is this a question about an individual or is this a question about a sample and its sample mean? All right, that is it for this video. I know these distributions of the sample statistics can be a little challenging. You might have to watch this video another time, but I hope you found it helpful. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more of these videos, you can subscribe, hit the bell to get notified. Also, a uh, big thank you to the Elgin Community College Board of Trustees who approved my sabbatical during the spring of 2021 semester. And that's what let me take the time to record and edit and produce and upload all of these videos for you. So. Thank you again so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.